Well, let's get into why don't we do our academy training uh, discussion first? We're gonna tonight. Our academy training is gonna cover archetypes. Kind of what does Swoo have? Is there ones that Tanner missed when he built the slide uh, that I'll get critiqued on? I'm sure. But we're gonna talk a lot about um, kind of what all the archetypes are for our academy training segment right now. All right, welcome back to our academy training segment. Tonight we're gonna be talking. We're gonna kind of kick our our archetype series off. We did this it, it, when we did our X Wing podcast. We also did an archetype uh, discussion. Uh, this one's obviously a little different because this is a specific. This is specific to a card game, but I thought it would be fun if we kind of talked a little bit about you know the archetypes we feel are in the game, um, kind of if the colors match, what the colors match, and then I also threw pieces in there because I believe there is future archetypes um, for decks that we are seeing some stuff for that possibly could come up. So as you can see, obviously they had four colors that they use for their alliances essentially, and we have. I kind of color coded them on what I feel the the specific swoo color fits closest to. Now I will say there is combinations, right? And that's the, we're going to talk a little bit about that after we kind of get through the deck types. One of the neat things about swoo is it allows you to play two colors together. So you essentially are putting different types. So for example, a blue blue, a double blue deck is like a heart. What you would call like a hard control in Magic, um, or um, I don't know whatever. Legends of Lurutana or whatever the other big card game is that my son plays. Um, but like that is a, those are really hard, hard control. But what Swoo gives us, what Unlimited gives us um, is the fact that we get to combine colors, which is this is something that we had in Destiny. Um, so this is not anything new to FFG. And this was something that's, a, to me, this is a genius piece of the game. So let's talk a little bit about what we feel the archetypes are. And then we can kind of talk a little bit about um, how we combine them and kind of what that means for the game, right? So essentially, we have the four pillars or whatever you want to call them that I essentially feel are kind of the staples inside of a card game. You have an aggro, you have mid-range, you have control decks, you have combo decks, um, and then you obviously have kind of what the four of them, you know, mix them together, mix and match them, right? So Alex, what, what is an aggro deck to you? So an aggro deck, I mean, the name is shortened from ag uh, like aggression, right? So it is literally just trying to uh, win before your opponent can stop you. But, uh, but you know, like super fast, like obviously the whole point is to, to win before your opponent stops you. Uh, but you see it like in this game as like uh, you just, just swing it at the base most of the time and then giving them like uh, plus two attack, plus three attack to just compound the damage on the base uh and like the whole goal is just to just go as fast as you can before your opponent stabilizes and then because you're probably going to lose in the end game <laughs> so you you see this very commonly with uh sabine and leia and i mean i guess theoretically ig88 but he's not uh, <laughs> around much yeah. but like you know pretty much any leader can be like an aggro, but Sabine, which is the, the auto base damage, and Leia with the double attacking tends to be the easiest and most commonly played. Awesome. Yep, and I would agree. So essentially your aggro deck, right, is is creating your threats. It's gonna have a very fast tempo, like it, it wants to be very quick, overwhelm you, and to some extent has a kind of repetitive play style, right? Like what are you trying to do? Just kill things, right? That's what Alex says. I just want to kill things. I don't care about anything else. I just want to kill you. Um, and, and it does that very well. And, and as a note, as a, as a note, IG88 is very fun to play and is super cool. But any leader should not be a 5-4. They could have just done it like Sabine and been a 4-5 if that's what they wanted to do. But if I could play open um, fire and just take it out, like, <laughs> like, yeah. you, like, hey, you just played that? I'm going to play open fire. So, yeah, have a nice time. Yeah. It's bad. Um, so that's kind of the high level of what an aggro deck is. Um, JJ, what is a mid-range deck? 
Uh, so a mid-range deck is a deck that kind of uh, excels in the mid-game, has a little bit of everything to uh, do uh, fairly well in the beginning to control as much as possible to allow your deck to develop um, in towards the middle of the game. does involve a little bit a little of, of ramping up to allow you to uh, play some of your more bigger cards mm -hmm. that can uh, benefit your side a little bit more. Um, so there is a little bit of delay in there, not to the point of like a, a control deck, um, but it does offer uh, a big payoffs later on as as the uh, the deck is or as your side develops uh, with its forces and its setup in that range there. Um, definitely a lot less aggressive than, than aggression uh, as it's trying to set up um, like a larger payoff in either attacks or setup for uh, for your deck. Um, so it does have a kind of like a toolkit of a lot of different options there and allows you to um, to win the game in the long run. Yeah, mid-range decks are, you know, I, I kind of put in there, they, they like to trade, they have a good ramp, they have a very flexible board. They're they're built to, they're designed to not just be, I'm going to do one or two things. I'm going to kind of be able to take the best of both worlds, but I'm also not going to be so overpowered that I just win every single game. Otherwise, we'd all we see is mid-range decks. So, yeah. like uh, Boba Green, right? You, we would all consider Boba Green very mid-range deck right yeah yeah now would you consider decks that are more toolkits to be more like mid-range decks i mean i guess it kind of just depends on what cards you have in there but uh generally they lean more towards like control right because that's what the whole toolboxy thing is just to yeah. have the answer for whatever your opponent plays yeah which is funny because we're going to talk a little bit in another episode about some of the decks and archetypes and how they kind of mix and intermingle together, right? Um, so, but all right, anything else on that? Uh, that is our our mid range decks. It's essentially designed to be very reactive to your situation. Then. We have control decks. Alex, what is a control deck, and why is that your favorite style of play? <laughs> <laughs> uh, control decks um, kind of basically just try to... Well, it's called stabilizing the board, right? Controlling the, the, the cards that people play in this game because everything enters exhausted, right? Um, you have a chance to respond. So if you play an A-Wing, I can play open fire, and then the A-Wing's gone before they had any threat or any impact on the game so it's more just like having the answers trying to not necessarily stall out the game but have a, a great end game that once you wear your opponent down enough that they can't do anything your end game is just going to be better than their end game and you win off that and generally you're seeing that right now with uh like Iden, palpatine krennic not really much in terms of uh, hero uh, characters for control, which is kind of weird. But uh, be kind of they don't have a lot of the, the tools, the immediate responses. So, yeah, it felt like they gave villain a very heavy aspect, a heavy dose of that this this game. Yeah. Yeah, so essentially, you know, so we have control decks. They're very, uh, they create answers to everything. They want to live forever. They like to disrupt your board state um, or give you zero board state, depending on uh, who you play against. And they, they, they're, they're in play. They have to win in the end game, you know. Um, and that's just where we get into combos of different things. But blue is giving us most of that control-ish uh, feel for the most part right now. Uh, the next the last one we have is a combo deck, right? And combo decks essentially their goal is to set up big plays, right? They're they're they have one or two specific win conditions. They have it set up so that they could create these, and their desire or design is to essentially say, "Hey, let me do my thing, leave me alone, and I'm going to do this." This this is a little bit more of a stretch in this game, right? For to say, yellow the yellow suit is specifically combo because it's definitely not. But I feel the yellow because of the... I, I would almost call it like a trickster. Like, that's kind of what it feels like a little bit more. But yeah, that's disruption. Yeah. It, 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 but it also has a heavy ability to set up combos. Like, the yellow has cards designed. You know, if you look at Boba Yellow, even though a lot of people are like, that's an aggro deck, and it is, 
it's also a combo deck because you're looking to set up specific plays, just not with one character, right? I can do my combo-ish things with my surprise strike or really shoot first, whatever. That's I don't consider that a combo card, but your surprise strike or your you know, you're specifically using a waylay to kind of set up, hey, I'm, how do I get my Boba to do specific things? Yellow was providing that toolkit um, for it. They, in my opinion, they like to develop a board. They cheat. That, that's what it feels like to me. Like they're they're the <laughs> they're what I would call the cheat deck. Um, in Destiny, we used to have uh, droids and you used to have Chopper and C-3PO and R2-D2. And you literally could play one or two cards and basically activate your whole board set. And, and do removal from your opponents. And it was just stupid. It was just like, I'm going to do, I'm going to activate my chopper, which then activates my R2, which then allows me to activate my C3PO. And then because I can sequence all of my timings however I want to, R2 is going to change the dice, C3PO is going to resolve it and give it a plus one. And it just was like, that's co that's combo. And then when you stop that, which FFG <coughs> had to run it so that it stopped it <laughs> because that was way too broken. Um, that it, it, it then was not able to compete as heavily, though there was other droid version decks for the life of the game until they killed it. Um, so that's kind of to me, that's kind of what the combo deck is looking for is big plays. They're cheating. Um, they're cheaters and they <laughs> like a developed board so that they can play their one trick or two trick ponies. So. So now we talk a little bit uh, before we get into future archetypes and i know you're seeing it down there and everybody's probably got questions we we will talk about those in a minute but what i want to kind of talk and focus a little bit more on is the uniqueness the unique aspects of what star wars unlimited is trying to do so i don't have a lot of experience outside of destiny in traditional card games so i don't know excuse me if either of you have a lot of experience in card games or other games but what it feels like they're trying to do is they're trying to say here let me give you different archetypes for you to play and then let me let me give you ways to combine them together to create more unique what we would call more unique deck types and and so like for example again we use the aggro control um as a as a like a piece like sabine blue doesn't work very well right it it, it doesn't it doesn't have enough power on one side and enough control on the other side it just doesn't know what to do inside of that deck right Whereas Sabine Yellow does have some of that. Sabine can come out very aggressive, but has all those weird tricky plays to kind of stall out some of the other aggro decks and to kind of put you put them on the other foot. So Alex, in, in this type of a, a feel, right? Inside of this type of a feel, how do you feel that how do you feel unlimited it works in terms of this? And do we have any colors that don't fit together specifically right now? Well, I, I mean, I like the aspects a lot just because you can um, just have just not like literally any deck you want, but like they play vastly different. Um, like even like you can go like aggro with like red Iden, right? Or you can go like super control with green or like have a mill deck with blue. So it's nice that they all can kind of just modify what you're doing and then you don't even have to like stick directly into those kinds of archetypes right you can start blending it to have more of like an aggro leaning mid-range deck or more of like a control mid-range kind of thing a uh, combo is a little bit hard to to mix with other things just because it's you know not designed that way <laughs> um but it, it's nice that you can um just to mix them together and then uh, for colors that don't like work work together uh, that's um, kind of limited I guess in this game most of the like yeah varying degrees of like power levels for for colors for leaders but the, you know like most of them are pretty viable like Vader has success with green and blue um probably not yellow too much but you can you know that's not like it's a bad deck it's just a little bit tougher to pilot so 
and, and the other aspect for it too is the keywords um and that's something that we're going to be seeing in the new packs coming out right you know we're going to see a lot more mando keywords um a lot more trooper keywords as well um and then of course uh the mechanic for smuggle uh for a lot of these cards that are coming out as well that just add another element to the play uh we're definitely going to see a lot of uh newer leaders design source those newer elements and uh, current leaders getting buffed up by the availability of the um, of the the cards that have those keywords that can be put in that same type of deck. Um, so you can essentially have like a Vader deck that's filled with a bunch of troopers, and you can help build your deck to help buff those particular trooper cards in that deck to go along with Vader, for instance. Um, and as the game develops more and more, um, we'll be able to get those kind of um, the more a niche type uh, style of decks that can that can really change how a leader's played, um, even with different colors of aspects. Yeah, and I think that's kind of the neat thing about about unlimited, right? Is when we talk about archetypes and we talk about specifically, you know, how you can understand and play them, they make it a little bit easier for us to understand, but more complicated when it comes to deck building because it's you like. Again, you if you watch the stream, you go back last episode in episode five. We tried to all build Sabine Blue, <clears throat> and you, you you can I'll just pick my deck for example. My deck um did not work. I actually played it a couple of times on Carabas, and then quickly just deleted it right out of my archive because I said nope. This is <laughs> like Charmer was definitely right there. I I didn't have enough. I didn't I didn't burn myself in enough specific directions. Right in. I think that's the neat thing about what we're getting with these archetypes is they're going to give us a base set and kind of as our series progresses next week, we're going to be talking in our Academy training series to actually talk about, um, you know, how, what, what I did, how do I identify each type of deck and kind of where they fit together. Um, and, and then from there, we'll be able to kind of keep going um, even further down the rabbit hole. One of the things I did want to do before we wrap this piece of the segment up is, specifically talk about future deck archetypes right and we could talk i put three on there um i did not put mill on there because i don't know if they're going to ever make mill an actual thing i do know mill does like you could kind of do it my my stepson was milled today so i know it happens um but i don't think it happens all the time but i, I think eventually we're going to get that style um that that type of an archetype um and i i kind of hope we get it not next set but the set after so let next set let me play some really cool stuff and then after that you could give me my mill back because i'll just run mill that's just what i'll do i'll just run mill for the rest of the the life of the series um but the the three other ones that i kind of wanted to bring up and then i'll let you guys kind of talk a little about I'll, and jj spoiled the one already it's called keyword soup and I didn't know this was an actual thing. And my son's, uh, my son's like, no, 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 I'm telling you that that's an actual thing. This is something that they have in like other games. And it's essentially where keywords benefit players and disadvantage their opponents. And it's designed like we see it a little bit with Tarkin. I think they tried to attempt it with Tarkin and it just didn't work very well. But we're getting Mandalorians. That's a huge keyword type thing. Underworld is going to be a keyword. Um, So they kind of go through and, and that's going to be a big thing that'll become, they're going to allow you to have a specific decks based on that uh the other one is the leader centric um and that's where they basically build a deck around the leader we saw that in De excuse me we saw that actually in destiny where they gave us uh kylo and ray as characters to play together and they literally designed cards that you that they were good cards to play outside of that but they worked super well together like they were genuinely aggressively designed to work together so you you could just you'd have a raylo deck and you would get to play it and it would be great and it was super fun to play and people hated it. Um, but they were, I feel we're going to get this. Maybe not next set, but I feel we're going to get that. And, and you you could kind of mix a little bit with the leader centric and the keyword soup. If we get like a Bando deck that really works really well or a Bo-Katan deck that just like only works with Bando and anything else you try with there doesn't work, then you know that that's what that specifically. But I believe we're going to see that in the future. Um, and then the last one I had on there was upgrades, but I think, I, I don't know, that's, the, again, that's, the, we're, we're pushing that envelope with it, but I feel that there's a possibility we could get decks focused specifically on upgrades that interact, um, like in bounties kind of do, but they're not all, 
specifically like that, but we're going to get people that or we're going to get decks supposedly that will be upgrade specific. And the upgrades are not just, oh, I'm going to put a lightsaber on Darth Vader to do an extra four damage to somebody, which is still really good and it should not be a two cost, uh, two drop cost uh, thing, but it is really good. Um, and um, I actually seen somebody use it on Darth Vader unit and put it a dark a ambush out and kill somebody, put another thing on there and you're like, oh, great. And now I have a Darth Vader unit that now is swinging for nine every turn. <laughs> so it's gross. Um, <laughs> yeah, I mean, uh, you, you get a little bit of the keyword stuff with like Leia, right? Because she specifically needs rebels to attack. You get it with Hera, who gets Spectre units for no aspect penalty. So there's already a little bit of there. The new uh, green heroic Boba leader deals a lot with keywords. So that's definitely upcoming. And you actually get a little bit of the leader centric too with Chariot decks, just kind of pumping them up and healing them enough because, you know, he doesn't die until the end phase, right? So. Well, not end phase, regroup phase in this game. Um, so, like, you're you're still you you got a little bit of it. Like the the seeds are there, and that's uh, pretty cool. Yeah, JJ, anything else? Uh, again, like I said, I didn't put Mill in here because I don't see Mill as a viable option as of today. But I do think it's coming. So. Uh, the other thing I think that the game is missing that we've seen in other games, and it, and it makes me wonder if they're going to eventually flesh it out a little bit, mainly because it tends to be associated with like negative play experiences, uh, is discards. You know, being able to control your opponent's hand by making them discard cards from their hands. Now, we do see a few cards that already have those components already. Um, and it basically removes the options from your opponent's deck, right? Um, or from their hand, uh, which limits their choices, what they can do. Um, typically those type of decks can, can be uh, a feels bad because, you know, especially when you're playing like combo decks where you're trying to build up to something like for a big punch and it gets taken away for you before you can even do anything about it. Um, it, um, it's it's tough, but there are some mechanics already that we see uh, coming up with some of the cards um, that have some that at least allude to a possible archetype that can be developed that way. Um, and it's something that has been a theme in a lot of different card games. And I think that that might be something that, that could be coming down the line as well. God, nobody likes hand destruction. Exactly. I, I do. <laughs> I mean, I do, but like you shouldn't. <laughs> They're not exactly. They're nobody not likes it, game. but everybody plays it. Exactly. I know. <laughs> I'll tell you what. Somebody did. They they ran Spark of Rebellion against me. Like they must have heard of me tell about how they're like, oh, I'm putting your favorite card in. And I was like, yep. I was like, bring it on, baby, bring it on. Put that Spark of Rebellion in there. I I I love it. I live. Literally- that Luke, that Luke Green deck had like two or three Spark of Rebellions in there. And I was like, okay, all right. I see what you're doing. But help just draws the extra card. I'm just going to ping my unit and <laughs> yeah. redraw another card. <laughs> but, you know, hey, thanks. I mean, I guess it got rid of two overwhelming barrages twice. So there you go. I mean, it, I can't get those back out of my my graveyard right now. So just wait. Wait till we get great stuff that comes out of my graveyard. Oh. I mean, you actually kind of get that a little bit. Like, my Han deck has a lot of that. Just between, like, home one, being able to play stuff out of there, and the Rogue Squad and Skirmishers pulling two costs or less out of the discard in your hand. But yeah, it's not, like, directly play from discard pile. Yeah. Not not like we, we've seen in other things. We had a little bit of that in Destiny, but, um, yeah, I think it will become something that they will do. The question is, is does that get to become an archetype where basically you use your units and then bring them all back and resurrect them. I mean, I guess technically there's that Pelt card that we, we I tried to play, the one where you yeah, basically... Legion. Yeah, where you kill off... But I never had enough board state that it mattered. Like, it just... And by the time I get to the end game when I have a board state, if I do kill them all off, I, you know... The only time that that's good... You know when that's good? Super Laser Blast. That's when it's great against that. <laughs> I, I haven't found that where I've had any enjoyment out of that. So... <laughs> All right, so it. that'll, that'll wrap up our academy training segment that we're going to do for today. Uh, we will do a segment for next week. We'll have a discussion a little bit about um, 
we'll have a little bit about uh, what type of how to identify what type of deck, kind of how to play some of those decks, what to look for, those type of things. We'll, we'll pull some a, a examples up and and bring them to you live. 